Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming and for making the effort and learning to navigate a little bit in the process. We uh, hang on a second. Okay. We actually kind of drifted into this. Let me get my picture here and get that out of the way. Okay. Um, we started with a virtual conference some years ago. It's been about eight years now. Um, it was the J. Sergeant Reynolds Community College Virtual Conference. And we made it asynchronous in Blackboard. And the purpose of it was really to introduce the technologies in Blackboard and that we could use in Blackboard to our faculty and get them you know, kind of used to uh, using those to showcase the way they were done. And it, it enabled us to network across the Virginia Community College system somewhat, especially the smaller colleges who, that didn't have much um, in the way of professional development. So it was nice to connect with them. It was asynchronous. We used discussion boards, things like that. And uh, it, it worked well. It accomplished a purpose, made Blackboard familiar at a time we were trying to implement it further. But after a while, it became uh, boringly familiar. Faculty were in Blackboard all the time, so they really didn't want to spend more time in there, especially in a conference type of thing. They needed something to freshen it up. Uh, our participation, we had the same people who would... Uh, register for it every year and the same people would present but we had the particip active participation was going down all the time so I decided at that point and I was not here at the beginning of that but I was given responsibility for it when I did come we decided that we needed to have something different something that uh, engaged people and so I went out you know looking what options were available what types of things could we do uh, a big part of that was what could we afford because there were many good options, but some of them were extremely pricey. Uh, one I priced at $8,500 for one day conference and 30 days of archives. So that wasn't going to work because the budget wouldn't allow it. Uh, we wanted to look at functionality. How well did it work? Was it dependable, you know, reliable type of thing? Uh, was there a steep learning curve? Because we didn't want to get into a Second Life situation. Uh, and any of you who have tried Second Life, the first time you went in there was probably quite interesting. Uh, and I've known people who gave up. And while the tech heads uh, really enjoy Second Life, and there's some cool stuff in there that you can do, and it's free, um, the learning curve for everyday faculty to be able to come in and enjoy the environment and learn in it without having to worry so much about uh, how to how to do everything was just too steep, so we had to have something better than that, and we wanted something that was really friendly to users that they would be, feel comfortable in and that kind of thing. So that's how we uh, ended up coming to this. And if I can get this thing to change, change. There we go. So we had to decide what do we want to be, uh, because. Taking a step into a synchronous environment meant that we would leave people out or we would have, you know, the, the whole scheduling idea was a, was something that we had to consider. Uh, we wanted to increase participation because we saw that declining and we felt like we had a good thing if we could really get a hold of people. Uh, we needed to freshen up. We needed to get rid of the stale part. And we needed to challenge and engage our participants. Uh, we could think of a lot of excuses, costs, because... We had run the virtual conference at, at pretty much no cost. So where were we going to get those funds if it was required? Uh, the trouble it would take involving uh, IT and things like that. And as you all know, since you're in here, you have to install an applet on your computer. But when working with a college, then uh, most faculty do not have administrative rights on their college computers. So we had to deal with that, you know, issues with the help desk and IT. Uh, time. For a synchronous conference, it was going to be difficult for some of them to get time. So, you know, how do they work that in? Um, obviously, technology is always interesting, and the frustration of navigating, which Dr. Araceli, you know, has discovered with her trackpad, that it doesn't work as easily as it should. So, they're going to face that. Uh, in an environment like this, you can really do anything uh, because it's, it's, make-believe in a sense. 
Uh, so there are a lot of possibilities there. But to make it a conference, and particularly when you have standard uh, environments like this, you have to kind of bend your, your conference to fit it so that it becomes uh, what you want it to be. Uh, formatting it, you know, how do we get signage and things like that? How do we set it up? What areas do we use for what? This can actually be programmed, but you would need someone who's good in gaming programming, in particular with the Unreal Gaming Engine. So that's, uh, you know, some of the considerations that played into it, too. Um, and then, you know, what does it really provide? Now, we chose, have chosen the past two years to record the sessions for this because that makes it available later to faculty who cannot get in during the live conference. And I've seen often coming into the environment in the evening, uh, there would be an avatar sitting somewhere, uh, you know, and they'd clicked on a recording and they were sitting there listening to it through their avatar. So that's kind of cool. Let's look a little bit at the data because that, and I'm going to have to enlarge this a second because it, I can't read it at this point. Um, this is a comparison over the last year that we did it in Blackboard and then the two years that we've done it in Avaya Live Engage. Now you see that uh, registrations went up over that whole period of time. We had um, 123 when we were still in Blackboard, we went up to 166 the first year in Avaya, and then a jump to 275 for the second year. Our active participation didn't go up until you notice the first year from Blackboard to the first year, active participants were about the same. But then uh, the second year in Avaya Live, we jumped that up quite a bit too with active. Uh, number of visits. But now this starts some of the comparison just between the two years we've been in Avaya Live. Number of visits actually went down, and what we think that was um, was that uh, faculty were becoming. Uh oh, we changed. Oh, there it goes. Sorry, that was me. <laughs> That's okay. I was going to ch change it back, but you beat me to the punch, Karen. <laughs> The number of visits actually declined, and I think a lot of that was because people were coming in and getting back out immediately. So there were a lot of immediate switch outs. And once people were more accustomed to using the environment, they were in, they stayed in, and probably since they had upgraded in that time, the environment was a little more stable and didn't kick people out as easy. <clears throat> but the number of visits... Uh, the minutes and hours of visits actually went down to the second year, too, even though there were more active participants. So I thought that was kind of an interesting thought. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what to make of that, except that people came in not to play around, but for a specific purpose of attending sessions in the conference. And once they did that and they talked to their colleagues, uh, some, and our uh, exhibitors, then they left which is good because we have a limit on the number of people in, so they need to make room for others. Um, so the, the amount in the visits went down. Conversations went down, too. Obviously, if you're not in, you might not have as much conversations. And um, in the number of conversations and in the minutes involved in conversations. Even though we did have more presentations, but what's interesting, look at all the way at the bottom. The percentage of visit time in conversation this last year, 98% of the time in the environment was spent conversing, engaging with someone, whereas the year before it was only 50%. Uh, that means they were doing a lot of walking around and trying to get their avatar to work, not really talking. Then the second year they were talking in that. So really pretty cool um, to see that data, and it's not always what you expect. And what we see, I think, here is an improvement in quality. And as we adjust to the environment, we're not having uh, unprofitable time, but we know how we want to spend it, and people are coming in and using it. So anyway, now it's Veronica's turn. So I'm going to talk to you today about um, conference presentations or what it's like to participate or present in a virtual environment. Um, as you would in a face-to-face -face conference, you typically try to pre-plan um, and analyze what it is that you're going to present, who your audience is, things of that sort. You would do the same thing for this virtual environment. Um, just because it's virtual doesn't mean that it's less of a conference than, say, you went to Sloan 
for distance learning administration. It's an actual real conference you get to put on your Vita, so treat it as such. If you have never participated in a virtual environment before, um, contact the administrator or the person um, in charge of the conference to find out if you can get a guest pass to um, explore the environment so that you get to a certain conference level in knowing what to expect, how to present, how to upload documents, how to maneuver around, things of that sort. If you're going to co-present with someone, consider using open resources such as a wiki or Google Docs to um, collaborate on your documents. It'll make the process so much easier, especially if you're in, let's say I'm in South Carolina and I'm um, co-presenting with Patrick or Karen, they're in Virginia. Well, obviously we can't meet weekly um, about this conference face to face. And so what we've done for this conference uh, this time around is compose our planning in Google Docs from the scheduling to the um, call for proposals, the registrations, um, the websites, the, the committee members, who's doing what, all of that was done in, in Google Docs. Very rarely did we email each other unless we had a quick question about something or to plan a meeting. Um, the same thing goes for if you're presenting or co-presenting. Um, rather than send your documents and your PowerPoints back and forth through email, um, consider using an open resource tool such as Wiki or Google Docs um, to make the experience more pleasurable. When you're talking about hosting um, coordinators and presenters, um, whatever your role is in this conference, whether it's participating, presenting, you're on the committee, discuss what those roles are, who's going to do what duties, um, by which due dates, and so forth. Uh, try to overcome any challenges, um, especially if you're not as technically savvy. Um, even if you are and if you've never used a virtual environment before, it's like with any other technology, going from Mac to PC, there's an adjustment. Um, so consider those challenges and um, uh, make sure you overcome those before you participate or present in a virtual conference. And as with anything else, um, look for practice time and support resources. This is a virtual conference, but yet it's still professional, so you need to treat it as such. There are oftentimes when you participate in a virtual conference, there's um, a period where we go online to meet and greet each other. So we may have never met some of these presenters before and may not meet them in life again. Um, but take the time to virtually meet and greet so that you get some familiarity with who you're interacting with when you're in the virtual environment. And build those relationships and networks. Um, Karen and I have never met face to face and this is the second year I believe we've served on the committee for this conference. So, you know, um, I feel as close to her um, as I do to Patrick and, and Patrick used to be my boss at the University of Alabama. So um, I consider Karen as close even though we've never physically met. And again, practice, practice, and practice. Embrace the experience. Um, don't focus so much on what may or may not go wrong, um, but embrace the experience and, and um, yeah. take some time to reflect on how you felt about what you've heard, who you've met, um, what you did, and, and um, see if you can't take that forward to your institution as you you know, start to um, continue to participate in virtual environments. In comparing virtual environments, I've only really engaged in two, and that was Second Life and now Avaya Live. Um, Second Life was several years ago in my undergraduate um, college years where it was mandated we had to use Second Life, and that was when it was first um, up and running and booming and everybody was all about Second Life. Well, I particularly... Uh, didn't really care that much for it because it was so cumbersome to use. Um, although I got the concept of the gaming experiences and the virtual experiences, um, Second Life was just not as secure um, of an environment for me to feel comfortable in, in using. Um, versus Avail Live, you have to have a subscribe subscription to it. 
uh, I mean a paid subscription to it and only users that you invite in can attend. So you can use this for your classroom teaching, uh, you can use this for your online teaching, and as you see, we can use it for virtual conferences. The engagement and interactions, the ease of use, and like I said, the security in Avaya Live is phenomenal. Um, many of you are in here for the first time, and with the exception of some minor hiccups with maneuvering around, you're upstairs, you're listening to me, we can talk back and forth, and you're at your desk doing whatever else it is you're doing and still um, being able to participate. If you use Avaya Live or get a subscription for Avaya, um, you can customize it for your school with the school colors, the mascots, the logos, whatever it may be. Um, you can work with the representative and Patrick can talk more about this um, and, and customize it to your look and feel. Um, you don't have to be in a building. Only, you know, the last couple of years we were in here, the presentations were um, in rooms, but the majority of the conversations almost happened outside um, along the, the waterfront. So, and, and then just spread the word about the um, increasing um, of the participation. Each year we hold this uh, for the past two, three years or three, four years. Um, the uh, enrollment, enrollments have been increasing and now that I'm in a different role I have been really spreading the word about this next conference all over social media um, my my new colleagues in South Carolina through eight campuses um, so just spread the word and, and get it out there that's how we're gonna um, move to the next step and talking about my virtual experiences um, in 2011 was the first time that I presented for Patrick um, in this conference, but at that time, the presenters had to record their presentations. The file had to be sent to Patrick, and he uploaded it in their um, LMS at the time. I don't remember which one it was, um, but that was how we presented. Um, participants would choose to pick the presentations that they wanted to listen to, and then they had to start a dialogue on a discussion board that the presenters had to monitor for a full week. So anytime someone had questions or comments about your presentation, that dialogue happened asynchronously. Um, it was interactive, but for me, not as engaging. Um, in 2012 and 13, I also presented. Um, during those two years, it was in Avail Live. And, that, and that, was, uh, that was wonderful for me. The presentations, all the presentations were done live. Um, they were recorded so that we all had access to those recordings. And those who could not attend the sessions could listen to those sessions. Um, those who presented had a link for their archives for their portfolio. And even if you went to the presentation and wanted to listen to it again, you had that opportunity to do that. Um, what made it interactive and engaging was the fact that you could actually go up to another person or another avatar, 13. shake their hand, yeah. um, jump up and down, um, you know, have that virtual conversation with them as if you were talking with them on the phone through the speakerphone. In 2013 and now in 20 for 2015's conference, um, I've served on the committee the scheduling committee, the training committee. Uh, the training committee was fun. Um, each person that was in a specific time zone who was on the committee took that time zone and trained, virtually trained those individuals who were in that time zone. So that way that cut down a lot of confusion on um, the conversion of time zones. So I served on the, like I said, the training, the scheduling, um, review the call for proposals and I'll, and I'll do the same again this year except this year um, Karen and I are vice chairs of the committee so like I said before we used open resource technologies to collaborate on the planning and building of the conference and we'll do the same for the evaluations some of the pros and cons of virtual conference experiences include um, of course, the retention, because, because you're engaged with this gaming-like gaming type of environment, 
um, you're going to be motivated to attend these presentations. You're probably going to be motivated to even give a presentation. But the fact that you have that actual interaction as if you were face to face um, helps with that retention. And because it's recorded, um, you have those archives that can be viewed in an asynchronous format, which also helps with retention as you keep um, watching and rewatching. For those who have never presented before and or may be considered introverts, this may be a nice um, format to use for uh, your first presentation because it provides a non-invasive um, type of environment where you're at your desk talking through your microphone and giving your presentation. You're the only one in the room with the exception of those of us who are listening to you virtually. So that could be non-intimidating and it could also help you build your first time skills in presenting. Again, I talked about the ease of use earlier. If you have uh, a mouse to help maneuver your, your walking um, and using the keystrokes to guide your walking, that's literally all you would have to do. Uh, with the um, exception of remembering some keystrokes for body movements and things like that, which you will get in the virtual training. Um, other than that, it's very easy to use. Um, the networking and collaborations, like I said before, Karen and I have not met face to face and now we're vice chairs of the committee for this conference. So to me, that says a lot for the, um, the respect that you can gain or have for each other professionally and, and have not met that person before. The engage, some of the uh, engagement theories that I have listed here, and there are others, um, are very fitting to the um, um, theory and application when we're talking engagement in, in, in virtual environments. Um, in a nutshell, as we know, um, the more engaging something is, the more apt we are to um, participate and retain that knowledge. And so this virtual environment really has done that. I can tell the difference from my motivation in participating and or presenting, meeting people, meeting new people um, versus the asynchronous format we did a few years ago. Um, you know, none of, none of that really stuck with me. If you're doing a virtual environment that is asynchronous, some of the cons could be that um, just the texting or the typing of discussions can be a bit boring so for some people. They need that, that um, actual social interaction. Um, also, it's a possibility that you could not have access to those text-based documents or text conversations after the conference. Um, they also are not very engaging, but to also not have access to review at a later date um, could not be as engaging. Um, sometimes we have excuses like time and cost and support, um, ease of use, um, technological um, self-efficacies can be a, a con for some folks um, in adapting new technology. Next, we're going to talk about avatar netiquette. And the reason why it's called netiquette is because you're on the net. Um, just as you would in a face-to-face -face conference, you would do the same thing in a virtual environment. And the golden rule is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So if you're at a face-to-face -face conference, you're at Sloan, you're at Distance Learning Administration, you're at Teacher Professor Conference, um, those are all great. But again, when you go to those, you put your best hat on. You put your best dress on. So you want to properly represent your institution or the company that you're working for. Um, not only them, but yourself as a professional. You're, you should um, dress accordingly. You wouldn't want to come in this virtual environment with a swimming suit on. Um, you wouldn't do that in a face-to-face -face conference, even if it was on the beach. You want to be courteous to others. You want to use um, proper language. Um, you know, no cursing and no um, foul type language among other professionals. Um, you want to pay attention. If you are having a conversation with someone virtually and you've left the room, 
um, escape so that your avatar looks ghost out. That will indicate to people that you are not physically or not uh, physically at your desk paying attention at that moment. Maybe you had to step away to answer the phone. Um, so, but what you don't want is to appear physically there and not respond back to um, the person talking with you. Um, privacy and security, make sure you are not breaching any privacies or securities or spreading rumors or you know anything like that. Again, conduct, conduct yourself professionally and accordingly. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Karen. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I'm Karen Kellison and I uh, work at Lord Fairfax Community College, which is in uh, Middletown, Virginia, up in the northern uh, tip of Virginia. And I have been uh, working with Patrick for a couple of years and with Veronica also. And, and as she said, our main, our only means of knowing each other has been virtually. So, but I feel like I know her. So uh, that's a pretty cool um, byproduct, I think, of being in the environment. Um, so I, my job is to talk a little about the future and to get you thinking. Um, I'm wondering if any of you have already kind of in your mind thought of a way that you might be able to use an environment like this or that it might be useful in your <clears throat> setting or in education. And if you press two, that will raise your hand. So raise your hand if you um, are thinking that there might be a use for this somewhere. And I'm also now going to see who's awake. <laughs> oh, yay, Stephanie. All right. Um, so sure, just like I can engage you, good job, guys, in um, having a discussion face-to-face, -face, I can engage you in this environment as well. So yeah, to think about ways that you might be able to use this, um, people have done this and people have done studies specifically in this environment, but then in virtual environments in general. You know, and here's uh, a list of ways you might want to use this. Um, student orientations, you know, at least at my college, we have a growing population of online learners and online programs. And so with that comes kind of a challenge, and that is how do you engage the online students with your community, with your um, college, with the people there? And so perhaps a virtual environment is one way to do that. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, uh, virtual office hours for faculty, as particularly when you're teaching online, you're always challenged with the um, creating a sense of presence, with making your teaching self-present, as well as helping students become present as, um, with each other. Simulations, I think one of the things that has come from Second Life is the use of simulations, and there, um, that was sort of the first uh, foray into creating simulations as part of education. And sometimes when you're walking around in Second Life, you you may be able to get to one of those locations where you can see frequently it's medical or um, health professions um, doing some kinds of simulations. So we can see lots of maybe possibilities for this. I do want to tell you a story about last year's conference. And last year I... Um, uh, they raised their hand, Patrick. Patrick's sending me like a little secret uh, thing. <laughs> I asked for hand raising, oh, but I didn't ask them what ways. Well, we'll get back to that, I guess. Um, last year in the conference environment, um, I had invited a small class and the instructor of that small class, and they came just to kind of experience it because her class was on communication and um, she had been challenging them to think a little creatively about communication. And she told me later, she's, well, she actually kind of ran me down in the hall and said, I have to tell you what happened when I brought my class in there. One of the students, um, you know, as a couple of you guys experienced, sometimes you can kind of get stuck. And one of the students had kind of gotten stuck up walking into a wall and couldn't get out of the wall in order to get into the auditorium. And some of you guys can relate to that. Um, and she said another student went over to help her and helped her kind of get loose 
and showed her how to get into the auditorium. And she said, but the interesting part of that is during, because her class was a face-to-face -face class, she said, before that time, the student who provided help had always sat by himself in the class. And she said, when the next class meeting that we had, he sat with the student that he had helped virtually. So it sort of broke down the barrier uh, for a couple of folks in her class to be able to, you know, engage face to face. And that's not a story you normally hear. People like to tell the story about how unengaging being virtual is. And I think it's really important to recognize the reality of it, as Veronica mentioned before, is that you can be very engaged and you can um, create a connection with someone that you may have an opportunity to continue in a face-to-face -face environment, or you may not. Um, given where we live, I may not ever meet Veronica face-to-face, -face, but I sure feel like I've collaborated with her quite a bit. So I thought that was um, an interesting tidbit. And then the one thing that I wanted to talk about, and then I will get to hear some of your, your ideas, um, is that we here at Lord Fairfax, we actually did write and receive a small grant last year because we were trying to figure out how can we get these online students connected because we know in the student development course it's really important to get students connected to somebody or some you know a sense of connection to your institution a sense of connection to a faculty member something because that has um, a relationship with how successful or how persistent they might be as they start their college career. So we are working on developing a virtual environment for this very purpose to use in the student development courses. Uh, first we said online, but actually we're gonna say no for all of them. And so we have some people developing what the environment might look like and what kinds of activities the students will do while they're in that environment. So while there will be some places to kind of hang around, what we've really started with are act, some activities that they typically do in the student development course um, and trying to translate those into game-like things they could do while they're in the virtual environment and collect a badge or some things that, that they can um, present to their instructor to receive some credits. So that's kind of an interesting thing that we're working on. But while, um, while I'm on this topic, I will then just ask you to, if anybody would like to share some of the ideas they have for it or some of the things that they've seen virtual environments being used for. And when you're out in the auditorium, we may be able to hear you, but the reason those microphones are out there is because when you step into the circle, then everyone can hear you. Otherwise, you might your voice might be kind of low. But would anyone care to share uh, some of those ideas that uh, when I said, do you have an idea? Whoops. Sorry about that, Veronica. Nobody wants to share. Remember, you're muted, so you have to press M in order to um, get there. Can, can everyone hear me, or do I need to move to the microphone? I, I can hear you, Stephanie. Oh, okay. Perfect. Um, I was thinking about having students practice presenting in this environment. I was talking with a colleague the other day, um, and she was saying how she switched um, she was doing a lot of things virtually with her students in class just because of uh, the flexibility it provided. And she talked about the importance of them being able to conduct themselves professionally in a virtual environment. So having something like this actually gives students an opportunity to practice with that, whereas some of the other more traditional LMSs don't necessarily do that. Yeah, They're I not think in that's... this very particular kind of way where you get to dress up in, in all of those other kinds of things and have professional attire and, and um, move in a space um, as opposed to just operating on a, on a purely textual basis. 
That's interesting because we have that, it really is a different way of thinking because there are these little hand gestures that Patrick's really good at using this when he speaks, um, but it's easy to forget to do these things when you're in the, you know, I'm sitting here, I'm moving my hands while I'm talking, but, you know, in person, but you can't see that. So you have to sort of make your avatar be part of that environment, and that brings in a different consciousness of what you're doing and where you're standing and all of those things that you sometimes lose when you're in person. Anybody else? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Not very well. Do you think you can step over to the microphone? Here you go. Okay. okay. Perfect. Yes. Oh, oh. Okay. Hello, my name is Araceli. And I was um, thinking that this would be ideal um, for faculty development. Um, currently, I'm the vice president of the American Association of Teachers of French for South Carolina, for the South Carolina chapter. And um, the French teachers meet in Columbia, South Carolina, and it would be nice to have something like this to include um, teachers from all over the state. Um, that way we could increase the participation rate. Hmm. Yeah, you know, we've, we've found, we've found that, Pat, you can chime in, but we found that when you, um, once you can get people past the idea of being in a virtual environment, you really can bring people together. I think that's been one of the greatest things about doing the Fantas Tech. Oops, Veronica, are you next? Is that why your picture comes up? I hope I'm sending the slides in the right direction. So just something for us to think about when we're discussing um, the uses and benefits of teaching and learning with a virtual environment. Do you think your faculty would participate in a virtual environment? Would your students be engaged with this type of technology as you're using it in your teaching? Would faculty perceive this as useful for teaching? What variables should be examined to predict the success? What recommendations would you have for overcoming difficulties such as cost, time, technology for using this type of format in your teaching and learning? Would a virtual environment enhance professional development for your faculty? You know, would you consider hosting a day too long or maybe even a week long conference for professional development for your faculty? So as you go through this experience um, today during this presentation and hopefully your you'll uh, present with us or participate with us in February for the next conference, um, assess what's happening and take that back to your perspective places and um, you know, question whether or not this will enhance some professional development um, for your staff and faculty and perhaps even your students. Well, you can also upload videos and share your desktop 
from these uh, containers, is what they're called. 